Um, thank you all for, for joining. My name is Rebecca Hanlon. I am a member of the Africa Lick Secretariat um, in, uh, based in Kenya. Um, you will get an introduction for those of you who are less familiar with Africa Lick shortly from uh, the Secretary General of Africa Lick, uh, Dr. Anne Kingiri. Um, we're going to also be joined today by uh, Dr. Gessi um, Karuri. Uh, Sabina, um, who is joining us from South Africa, and we hope also uh, by Professor Ned uh, Lorenz, Edward Lorenz, uh, but he is currently um, uh, MIA uh, from, from the event. Um, today's event is our uh, second Africalix uh, uh, webinar and uh, is focused on mentorship. Uh, Africalix has been involved in mentorship for a number of years now and um, in various different ways. And so what we will discuss today is um, the experiences of Africalix in, in mentorship. Uh, and by mentorship, we're talking about support and mutual learning, um, not just by PhD students, um, but with, with, a, with a supervisor, but also uh, much more broadly um, around uh, ad hoc support um, of, of, a, of, of um, an early career researcher with, uh, with, with, a, with a more experienced uh, researcher and um, through some more specific schemes that Africalix runs, such as the Visiting Fellows Program and the, the PhD Academies. Uh, so Anne will give you uh, a background to, to how that's been going and some of the lessons that we've learned. Uh, Gessie uh, will then uh, speak to us about um, her experiences of, um, of mentorship and what we can learn uh, more broadly uh, with regards to mentorship. And in between Anne and Gessie, we should have um, Ned, if he's able to join us. Um, and he will be speaking uh, with specific reference to Africa Lix and his experiences as a mentor um, of a, a number of different um, elements of, of Africa Lix mentorship schemes. So um, without further ado, and um, hopefully we will be joined by Ned, um, I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Kingiri, uh, to Dr. Anne, um, to, to start her presentation. So thank you, Becky. Uh, thank you, Becky, for the introduction. Uh, maybe we should know who is with us, or or, or should we just assume that uh, we, we everybody know each other? Uh, there's quite a few people, so um, people can quickly say their name um, and uh, one 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 or two words of introduction. But we should we should keep it short, I think, because we are now running running behind. How do we do it? <laughs> So maybe if people would like to introduce themselves, we could have a few people put their cameras on and uh, just quickly say their name and, and where they're, they're joining us from. Morgan, I believe you're, you're muted. So I, I think it's, oh, okay, I can see people are, uh, are writing on their side chat. So, so maybe that's the way we should do it. Sounds good. Please introduce yourself on the side chat and uh, we, will, we will continue with the, with the presentation. So, so can you see my, you can see my, my, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, that's good. 
So I need to put it on uh, presentation mode. So you can see my screen. Good, okay. Um, I'm going to be quite brief. Um, I, I'm just going to share, you know, uh, Africa ex experience with regards to uh, mentorship. And, and uh, our focus has been uh, using mentorship as a tool to building research capacity in a particular field, innovation and development. Uh, I will, uh, I don't know how I can, I can move the slides. I'm not able to move the slides. I'm struggling. I need help. <laughs> okay, uh, well, while we deal with the, uh, yet another technical issue, um, I see people have been um, have been um, introducing themselves. So we have uh, Professor Toko from Nigeria. Uh, we have uh, Dolphine from, from Kenya. Uh, Grace Mauer uh, joining us from the African Academy of Sciences. Hi, Grace, nice to see you. Um, Dr. Anu from India, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I know it's, it's uh, getting late in India. Um, so, yeah, now I'm sorted, Becky. Great. Thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, th sorry for the hitch. Um, I'm going to introduce um, uh, uh, who we are, for, especially for anybody who is new to Africa Rix and Groberics. I highly doubt whether we have anybody new, but uh, for the sake of one or two who may not, I will introduce who Africa Rix and Groberics are. I will then uh, introduce uh, how we approach mentorship as a network, as Africa Rix. Then I will go into the survey results. And of course, I'll conclude with the uh, thinking about the future in terms of uh, what type of uh, strategy or approach should uh, we be thinking about, not just Africanists, but any other you know, uh, uh, institution that may be thinking about strategy. And of course, we are going to open up uh, uh, afterwards uh, everything to a discussion so that we can have uh, uh, experiences from whoever is participating today. Um, uh, for those who do not know uh, Africa Rix and Groberics, you know, Groberics uh, is basically a global network on the economics of learning, innovation, and competence building system. And this is a global network which uh, consists of uh, a wide range of uh, experts in uh, economists and social scientists. And of course, now we are having a natural scientist who are also interested in uh, issues of innovation and competence building and, and how this can contribute to economic, uh, sustainable and inclusive development. Uh, it is a bit uh, old network. It started in 2002. And Africanics is basically uh, the African chapter of, of, of Groberics with the same, same, same ideas, but uh, our main goal is uh, to promote uh, development of STI, or science, technology, and innovation research capacity uh, in Africa with the uh, strong links to the users. And when I talk about the users, is the communities of practice, you know, across, you know, communities, you know, scientists, researchers, private sector, all those who could be interested in uh, uh, this particular aspect. <clears throat> Um, I'll not go into uh, um, um, much more about what we do, but I will go straight to uh, looking at uh, how we approach mentorship. And, and at, at the introduction at the beginning, Becky said uh, uh, mentorship is tried to explain what, uh, how we look at mentorship. But basically, we, we are looking at mentorship not differently from other, other, other sectors. We are informed by what has been happening in other sectors. There is a lot that has been done uh, in health sector around mentorship as a tool for uh, uh, sharing knowledge. There is a lot that has been done in the education sector. So we are actually drawing inspiration from what has been done elsewhere. 
And basically we look at mentorship in terms of you know, interact, being an interactive process between uh, uh, those who are perceived to have uh, first experience. And in our case, we are looking at those who have got uh, knowledge and expertise in the area of innovation and development field and someone who actually wants to learn about this particular experience. And, 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 and of course, uh, uh, that particular interaction can, be, can, can uh, uh, result in uh, mutual learning uh, where you know, uh, there'll be you know, benefit like a win-win kind of uh, uh, a situation where the one who is uh, mentoring and the one who is being mentored, they share and they learn from each other. Uh, it is about actually transmission of, uh, of knowledge uh, informally, it could also be formal, uh, knowledge on, on social capital and psychosocial support, which is relevant for not just uh, our career progression, but also in uh, our area of, of what we do every other day, as well as in, uh, in our professional development. So basically, that's how we, you know, we 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 perceive our mentorship to be to to be about. But when we come to the area that uh, we we are working on, the field of innovation and development, uh, we know that uh, we are motivated to look at that particular area for a number of reasons. Uh, innovation, and we are all aware, is becoming an increasingly important in many, many areas, uh, policy, practice, as well as in capacity building. And we are seeing, especially in the education sector, innovation is becoming embedded in what we, the, the, the education systems are doing. Uh, some of them are actually even developing curricula, which speaks specifically on this particular aspect of innovation. So innovation is becoming important in all areas, you know, uh, whether it is uh, research policy as well as capacity building. Uh, and training in, in uh, innovation and development studies uh, is, is multidisciplinary. You know, it cuts across all, uh, uh, many, many disciplines. I don't think there's any discipline which uh, uh, does not actually speak uh, about innovation or which does not, uh, you know, uh, apply innovation in whatever it does, it is multidisciplinary in nature and it also in theory in, and also in methods. And, and it, it, it borrows uh, quite a lot from uh, innovation studies as well as uh, development studies. So this is the area, uh, the field of area that we are focusing on as, as a network. And in this particular area, which is multidisciplinary, you know, uh, we, 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 we are looking at, uh, we, 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 are, we are looking at uh, how innovation uh, is impacting, you know, whether it is positively or negatively, we are looking at how it impacts on economic and social development. And of course, now we, when we talk about SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, we, people are speaking about uh, uh, its, its impact in terms of in environmental uh, aspects. So it, it, it's, we are looking at how innovation you know, impacts on social and economic development generally. And in this particular field, which is multidisciplinary, there are quite a number of questions that uh, we, we the, the offer action questions that we ask, uh, the offer action questions that researchers would ask. And when we are training, there are those questions that we do actually you know, um, uh, emphasize on. For instance, you know, what type of innovation activity is most appropriate to, to ensure that uh, the society benefits, whether it is an individual, whether it is a household or a community. We also ask questions around, you know, how does innovation take place in countries that are resource poor, as opposed to those which are resource rich. We also ask questions around you know, what's the difference between innovation, you know, in terms of where it is coming from, the formal sector, informal sector, and what are the impacts of the different types of innovation in these sectors, whether it is informal or formal sectors. And we also ask about uh, what does innovation in different environments, what, how, who does that particular innovation, who, who is engaged in innovation in, in different environments, and how can different social groups you know, participate in the innovation process. And, and of course, we do ask questions around, you know, what are the enabling environments factors that are key for innovation to, to, uh, to, to become socially and economically relevant? 
and is, is there any need of promoting an enabling ecosystem or an innovation system that would enhance this particular innovation or innovation process per se? So these are the kind of questions that we do ask in this particular field, which we have argued that is multidisciplinary. And we need to look at some of these particular aspects that disciplinary studies do not actually focus on. Um, coming back to Africa Leaks and the mentorship, you know, we, we uh, since the inception of Africa Leaks in 2012 up to, to now, we are we've been undertaking quite a number of uh, activities that are geared towards you know, building capacity in this particular field of innovation and development. There are quite a number of activities uh, ranging from uh, academies, you know, uh, research conferences, uh, 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 visiting federal program, PhD visiting federal program. There's, there's also the pilot uh, VFP program. We have had, you know, uh, activities around the uh, seed, uh, seed funded research projects where we were giving funds for uh, a collaborative uh, 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 research across Africa. And we have also been uh, undertaking training, uh, focusing on the, you know, as uh, uh, scholars. Uh, and, and the uh, lecturers, you know, those who are teaching. So we've been doing quite a number of, of activities that we can argue have, have got an element of mentorship. But in particular, when it comes to mentorship, that what, what is this that we have been doing? Uh, if we, I look at uh, PhD academies, uh, I, we, uh, we would argue that uh, we have been uh, uh, undertaking activities that have to do with the uh, you know, uh, the, the PhD uh, students who uh, apply and they are taken for this particular program, they receive feedback on their paper, on their papers, and, and their papers. Sorry about that. Hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, they have been receiving feedback on their papers and the proposals that they submit for the academy. And how do they get that? You know, they receive uh, 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 oral or written input from uh, senior scholars on innovation and development. And they, are, they also receive feedback from uh, peers, you know, their, own, their federal PhD uh, uh, students who participate. And when does this happen? Uh, it happens uh, with, the, uh, it's a one-time input uh, during the academy, which takes about two, uh, two to three weeks and they receive input during that particular time, but they also receive input post the academy. And that has been happening uh, with the, many of the PhD uh, academies beneficiaries within Africa Ricks. Uh, with the PhD uh, visiting federal program, uh, what the kind of uh, mentorship they receive has to do with the receiving feedback on their papers or chapters of their thesis or proposals and they also receive personal development support. And, and uh, how does that happen? Uh, they receive feedback from uh, one junior and one senior mentor uh, in, uh, in a form of a written form or interaction when they meet, but they also receive you know, uh, uh, comments when they, they, they meet physically with, uh, with the mentors. Uh, and when does this happen? It, it can happen during uh, different times. Uh, when they are visiting, you know, because this happens at Oborg University, they receive feedback there in Denmark, but they also receive uh, feedback, you know, uh, after, you know, either before and after. So quite a number of uh, times that they, they would receive, you know, uh, feedback, uh, mentorship related feedback. Uh, with regards to the output that is expected, you know, uh, if it is the mentorship has to, is focusing on uh, 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 writing a paper or, or, or uh, developing an article or the, a dedicated mentoring activity, the kind of uh, uh, support they get, so a mentorship support is uh, the feedback on the draft papers uh, so that they could improve on it before they submit it to wherever, whether it is a conference or whether, whether it is for publication. And how does it happen? You know, it's a, the mentee, mentor, when they are matched together, you know, uh, whether it's during the conferences or during the academy or, or during the piloting mentorship activity, they would receive input, you know, during that time. And, and from the, the, the scholars, the uh, innovation development scholars, the senior ones, 
they would receive written input and, and sometimes they also receive you know verbal you know input and when does this, ha this happen it can happen you know at different times but it is motivated by the interest of the mentee and and of course during the conference and during the postdoc pilot program that is taking place now there is uh, some form of informal mentoring that is taking place and that is basically how Africa is, is approaching mentorship, uh, informally or formally uh, uh, dedicated activities, uh, either academy or visiting federal program, but also the, the, the short term, you know, activities like conferences that we are having, we are holding. So that's how mentorship, mentorship is taking shape uh, within Africa Rigs. Uh, we undertook a survey, you know, uh, to understand, you know, uh, the perception of uh, those that we are engaging with. How do they perceive mentoring as, as a tool to building research capacity in the field of innovation and development? We undertook a survey in March 2020, just before COVID. And uh, we, 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 we decided to undertake this survey because we, we, uh, 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 we believe that mentoring is one of the pathways that has been uh, accepted. There's a lot of uh, evidence that it is indeed uh, a tool, a powerful tool that can enhance uh, capacity building, not just for individuals only, but also for the universities as well as other institutions which would be which which are interested in this particular thing. Uh, and particularly in the higher education, there is evidence that uh, mentoring. Is, is critical to building both human and uh, human development as well as social capital. And of course, within Africa since 2012, we, uh, since 2015, we have been piloting uh, on mentorship as, as a tool for building capacity and, and enhancing both short-term and long-term capacity within this uh, uh, innovation and development theme. And of course, we wanted to understand how best research capacity building in this field can be advanced uh, in the African context. So we undertook a survey and uh, the re our respondents were, uh, uh, they ranged across, you know, uh, early career researchers, majorities were PhD students, and we also have had a, a few uh, senior scholars and these happen to be mainly those who have been involved in, in, uh, in mentoring of some of these students. So, so that is the rate we had. The, we sent out uh, 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 60 um, uh, questionnaires, and we got uh, that one. So we we, we can we can uh, we can say that we achieved the 50 percent response rate, which is is good. And the focus of our survey uh, was uh, it was organ our survey was organized around the four uh, main uh, areas. The first one was on questions that focused on benefits of mentoring. And um, the respondents, you know, had varying perceptions about what is, uh, is how beneficial mentoring is with regards to this particular area that we are focusing in, innovation and development. And, and of course, the, 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 the responses which were uh, dominating were had to do with mentorship, complementing, you know, home supervision. And of course, this is not an unexpected because um, any of the respondents were actually undertaking their PhD. And uh, the respondents, uh, and a majority of them, uh, they perceive mentoring to be key to building capacity in this particular area. And, and others uh, felt that uh, uh, um, it exposes mentees to new ideas and methods, as well as deepening the understanding on this particular area. And uh, uh, another big group uh, perceive mentorship to be a pathway to career opportunities uh, in this particular field. Uh, there were other varying, you know, uh, reasons why we should pursue mentorship, and but these were the main, uh, the, the the ones which were uh, uh, quoted or which were exposed, which um, the majority of the uh, respondents felt they are key for this particular area. Uh, the other area that uh, we uh, we were we looked into at the questions that we formulated was around the availability of, of opportunities to engage in I and D mentorship, and of course the reason why we wanted to have a feel of this particular aspect was because of the years uh, Groberics and Africanics has been involved 
in the many, many uh, capacity building activities. And he wanted to have a feel of what uh, the stakeholders feel about all those activities. And it emerged that Africa Ricks academies were perceived to be the, the, the most important in terms of offering opportunity for mentorship. And this was followed by the social media platform and then conferences uh, within Africa Ricks and conferences within Group Ricks. But I want to mention here that in, uh, the uh, respondents uh, responded in terms of whether they have participated in either of these activities. So there were a number of uh, respondents who had not participated in uh, some of the activities. Um, uh, we, we, we realized that based on the responses that uh, Africa Rick's approach to mentorship, uh, it combines, you know, what we perceive to be a high potential outreach, you know, the social media conferences and academies, you know, they are high potential outreach in terms of the number reached in terms of the timing, the period that is taken. Uh, com and we combine that with the, the more resource intensive activities like the PhD and postdoc visiting fellowship program, which is, they are quite a bit uh, uh, resource intensive because they involved uh, around a period and they involve a lot of uh, activities, including traveling. So, so our approach to mentorship actually combined now the two you know, the high potential outreach and uh, the, the resource in intensive activities, which are perceived to provide some kind of in deep, you know, deep learning. Uh, the, the other questions that we asked on the questionnaire had, uh, were asking questions around uh, the mode of interaction, as well as the mode of engagement. You know, we wanted to gauge, you know, which mode of interaction would be feasible and which would be effective and how to engage. Uh, and based on the responses, uh, it emerged that the best and productive mentorship relationships actually thrive on frequent face-to-face -face interactions, complemented by virtual interactions. And of course, there were quite a number of factors that determined uh, you know, how they assessed these particular aspects. And cost, efficiency, effectiveness, these contextual issues were very, very critical particularly when you are looking at uh, uh, low income and low middle income countries. And of course, for Africa, our focus is Africa and mainly low, and, uh, low income countries and low middle income countries. So these contextual issues were perceived to be very, very key when you're looking at uh, the mode of interaction and engagement. Uh, and then there was the, uh, the, uh, the final questions which were formulated around how to design a mentorship program that would actually target uh, this particular topic, this particular theme, and also target the African scholars. So the questions that were formulated for this particular issue, you know, focused on, you know, um, what kind of a program uh, would, would be feasible in, when you are looking at both the field and also the African scholars. And based on the responses, you know, uh, the scholars were in agreement, I mean, the respondents were in agreement that uh, some form of structure would be key. Some form of a structured program is, is very crucial. So th there were those who felt that you, we need to have a fully structured program. And uh, those were uh, almost half of the respondents, but uh, uh, the majority felt like we needed, yes, this need to have a form of a, a structured form of a program, but also to combine that with some form of ad hoc kind of activity and what we called a missed program. One with a, a, some form of structure and a, a small aspect of uh, ad hoc activities. Uh, and for this particular you know, uh, mixed program, uh, the, what was appearing is the nature of, you know, the competitive uh, nature of uh, the mentorship activity that would provide for you know, pairing of different activities and programs as well as you know, uh, having some dedicated mentoring effects, you know, embedded uh, in the program. Uh, something else which they consider to be key in such a missed program would be, you know, the flexibility around the program that would actually accommodate, you know, the mentee, mentee, ment mentors, and mentees' need, and of course, you know, some kind of, and you know, embracing the changing needs of the society that may be, you know, unexpected. And, uh, and in the case of uh, the, the, the mentees, you know, uh, as a kind of program that would uh, cater for some financial support 
uh, which is key, especially for scholars who are coming from Africa. And then the other aspect has to do with, you know, if you can engage in a wrong distance mentorship, and in this particular case, uh, the IND mentorship, we cannot avoid the wrong distance mentorship because of the nature of the, of the field, because the expertise, are, most of them would be based in the, in the north and the mentees would be based in the south. So the wrong distance mentorship activity cannot be avoided. And therefore, a mixed program would provide for that kind of, uh, you know, uh, of structure where there will be face-to-face -face meetings where it is feasible and also some other forms of uh, follow-up, you know, engagement like emails, uh, communication, or even uh, Skype, you know, that kind of a mixed program, which is not very, very structured, it provides for that kind of, uh, you know, uh, of, of uh, embracing of that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, scenario. And, and in, in the case of uh, the intended goal, uh, a mixed program would actually provide for, you know, the, the possibility of uh, uh, publishing and also guiding uh, towards, you know, some future collaborative activities and opportunities. So these are things that uh, the respondents felt like they cannot be put within a structured program and they need to be embedded within a structured program. Dwelling into uh, the structure aspect of it, because all of them were in agreement that, you know, uh, some form of structure would be key. And we asked them, you know, in, in terms of that structure, you know, that structured nature of the program, what are some of the aspects they would consider to be, you know, factored in in such a structured program? And of course, there were firing responses, and the majority uh, felt that, you know, in that structured uh, form format, there is need to train on methodology, particularly statistical methods and qualitative methods, and econometrics. When we asked uh, some follow-up questions, there. so uh, on that structure should be organized in such a way that you know, methodology aspects would be, you know, factored in, you know, uh, in a structured way. Uh, others felt that, uh, you know, uh, that program should uh, provide for a structured post-training for all between three to six months, uh, where, you know, after the training, uh, the, the, the follow-up would enhance, you know, uh, finding out whether the mentees are, you know, sticking to their you know, to their uh, mentorship plans and whether they are, uh, you know, making any progress. So that post, you know, training, they consider to be something which should be structured. And others felt that the, that structure aspect of the program should provide for uh, targeted and uh, specific relevant theories on this particular field because it's cutting across quite a number of, of areas. Uh, innovation studies as well as development studies. So, so specific theories that are relevant to the two would should be uh, be part of what th that forms that aspect of the structure or of the structured part of the program. Uh, others felt that you know uh, you know that aspect of structure should actually involve you know um, approving of uh, 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 the mentorship activities between the individual. Uh, and the institution that that particular uh, uh, you know approval uh, the 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 memorandum of understanding should actually be factored in in the program you know uh, between the individual and the institution although not so many felt that should this should actually be part of that structure aspect of the program but a few of the respondents thought that is something which would strengthen you know uh, the feasibility of the mentorship uh, activity. Uh, uh, there, there was one individual who uh, uh, co considered, you know, uh, having specific skill sets, you know, embedded in the program. But when we followed up, that particular person had uh, uh, some aspects of methodology uh, that he was referring to, and therefore we thought what he said would actually fall under methodology. So basically, those are some of the aspects that. Uh, the respondents felt they should actually be factored in on, on that particular stack structure. The structured aspect of the program should have this uh, uh, aspect you know, factored in. And then now you can come in with these other ad hoc aspects, which can be embedded then within that program. So that basically was what uh, uh, the feeling of the respondents was about the aspect that they consider to be key uh, even as the as we we design uh, a mentorship program or a mentorship uh, a strategy.
And uh, to, to conclude, um, based on what we have learned over the years uh, within Africaris and uh, within Groberics, and of course, you know, uh, based on the survey, uh, we are asking, uh, 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 we are thinking about ideas that would actually, you know, uh, provide some kind of uh, you know, uh, discussion uh, around a future mentorship approach or strategy, not just for Africans, but also for others who may be interested in, in this particular aspect. And some of the ideas that are coming up from uh, all that, uh, there are quite a number, but we pick quite a few that we can discuss after, after this, uh, the flexibility of the strategy or the flexibility of the approach. Uh, our experience as a network suggests that uh, there is usually a, a possibility for flexibility. And if you look at what we have been doing, the different forms of mentoring you know, uh, that we have pursued, you know, uh, whether it is uh, uh, within, uh, you know, wh whether it is uh, short term, long term, or whether it is uh, for publish, publishing or uh, writing articles or you know, improving on the chapters. These forms of mentorship, you know, which have been pursued uh, in different activities like academies or conferences, we have seen there's some form of flexibility that we can, can be provided for. And therefore maybe a, a, a strategy that provide for flexibility that probably would be uh, key. Uh, the other aspect is context specific. I have actually mentioned this. I alluded to context, context uh, previously, especially if you're looking at Africa, if you're looking at uh, raw income and raw, you know, those countries which would perceive to be resource poor. So you, the context is very key. And when you're designing a, a, a mentorship plan or a strategy, and when you're implementing the same, some of those issues you, they have to be taken into consideration because uh, in, uh, uh, the needs, they fight depending on what, where, and the needs of uh, those who are being targeted. And therefore, a holistic approach to mentorship would actually draw on a mix of factors that are commensurate with the resources that are available, and not just the human resource or competence, but also resources in terms of money and resources in terms of time, because uh, individuals and institutions, you need to think about all these aspects, including timing. You know, when, when are you going to be uh, providing the mentorship? Is it for PhD students? Is it for master's students? Is it for early careers? Is it for postgraduate? You know, those, that timing, as well as the resources that are needed, those are very critical. So context is very critical. And perhaps that is something that we, we may need, need to consider. Uh, the other aspect that we think it is critical is the adaptability of the strategy that uh, provides for learning. Uh, and uh, perhaps this would be speaking to a virtual mentorship program. And I think we have learned a lot from COVID-19 pandemic, where it has required that uh, different uh, activities, they shift and adapt to the, 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 uh, the now we are calling it the new normal. And therefore, learning has been critical, adapt adapting has been critical uh, to us, you know, uh, basically uh, for the time being virtual activities. But we are hoping that in the future we'll be able to accommodate, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, physical uh, activities and combined with, with, with the virtual activities. So the, 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 the flexibility in terms of adapting, you know, to learning that is something which perhaps we may consider even as we think about a future mentorship approach, uh, not just for Africans, but also for other you know, uh, institutions or other actors who'd be interested. And therefore, factual activities, which uh, so far we assume they are cost effective and perhaps they would allow for scaling up of, of the mentorship activities that we've been able to conduct of a, of a, since 2012, Perhaps with the factual, you know, digitization, uh, maybe we might uh, scale those activities to a level where this can benefit more people. And therefore, of course, uh, more importantly, you know, reducing the vulnerability of any shock, uh, the, the, the pandemic we are talking about now, but we are not very sure of other uh, shocks, like even funding that we rely on from uh, external, you know, uh, support. So this is something to think about. 
Now, the other aspect that is coming up uh, has to do with the, you know, a semi-structured approach. Of course, we are calling it, uh, in, in the survey, it, we were calling it a, a mixed uh, approach. But here, it is much more than that. It is a semi-structured approach that would be targeted to, you know, the needs, you know, of, of, the, of the mentees and the needs of the mentors, you know, whereby you could, yes, you could go factual, but you target to the, the, the training to the specific areas that you have expertise on, on the one hand, but also, you know, the, the areas that uh, the mentees would require capacity, build, uh, capacity building on. For instance, we may focus those non factual events would focus on key theoretical contributions and methods in this particular field. And with, we combine that with more individual feedback sessions on draft papers and discussions of publishing and career opportunities. So very, very targeted mentoring based on needs of both the mentors and the mentees. In, uh, based on our experience, you know, Africa Rick's experience with the pre events of the academies, because we have to go virtual, and we are assuming even post, you know, these events when they we hold them, there will be some kind of, you know, you know, yeah, some, uh, you know, sitting and rethinking mentorship generally, because uh, we are seeing that increasingly mentorship is 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 going to become virtual or an online activity. So such a semi-structured approach that factors in, you know, both, both the, the, the structured activities as well as the ad hoc activities, as well as the needs of both the mentors and the mentees, a semi-structured approach, that's something maybe we may consider uh, as we think about uh, a future mentorship approach or strategy that, uh, that is uh, feasible for the, the, our context for Africa, as well as for the area, this area that we are looking at. And I think I will stop there so that we can have an engagement uh, in a conversation. We know, I, we, I'm aware there are people who are listening to us and who have been involved in mentorship and we would like to hear from them how best or how, how we can think about this particular topic moving forward. So I hand back to Becky for the next uh, uh, step. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, that was uh, very informative um, and uh, I'm very thorough. And I think we've heard um, a set of issues around the structure and the way that um, mentorship is designed. So whether it's individual or group focused, whether it's ad hoc or formal, long term or short term, face to face or virtual, one of the key things that we're grappling with now. Um, you mentioned uh, implicitly a question around the degree to which uh, it's south-south uh, support versus north-south support and and then the issue of resource intensive versus low cost and, and cost effective so a series of questions around structure and um and the the fact that the survey highlighted that people uh seem to appreciate a mix uh with regards to to the way that mentorship was structured um, in terms of content, um, you highlighted the fact that um, AfricaLix provides mentorship both in terms of theory, methods, and, and empirics, um, and that there was a, a strong focus on, on, the, uh, on, on methods and, and to some extent, uh, or to a slightly lesser extent, also on, on theory. Um, also, you mentioned the fact that the, the way in which mentorship happens um, is, is either focused uh, in terms of content around papers or on PhD theses um, and at, and at postdoc level. And particularly that there was, uh, there seemed to be from the, from the survey, um, a, re a request for more um, post the PhD uh, support. So at the postdoc or early careers uh, level. Um, and then there were a set of issues that you raised around outcomes on. So what was the, the impact of, uh, of, of the, the mentorship. So whether it led to specific outputs like uh, completing papers, completing your thesis uh, more quickly. Um, in some cases, you mentioned that uh, there was issues around long-term collaboration and increased networking opportunities. Um, and, and then this, the big issue and, and more general issue around career um, enhancement um, uh, through, through um, engagement with, with, with other scholars. 
Um, so a really interesting set of issues that you raised around structure, content and outcomes. Um, I would like to ask you to, uh, to bear with us and um, let's take the second presentation. If you have questions or comments uh, from Anne's presentation, please start typing them into the chat. And then after the second presentation, um, we, will, um, we will start addressing uh, those, those comments and, and questions and start the discussion. Um, we do not seem to uh, have uh, Professor Lorenz with us, so I would like to uh, move swif swiftly on to, uh, uh, to, to the presentation by Dr. Gessie, um, who, uh, I, who is one of our Africa Lake Scientific Board members um, and has, um, uh, has uh, a long experience in, in mentorship from other programs. And so we'll give her, um, her, her reflections on, on the future of mentorship for, for Africa Lake. So Gessie, uh, welcome. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Becky, and, and, and thanks, Anne, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation uh, and really for a very good paper. So I think I'm quite um, honored to be able to speak after this. Uh, I'm actually sorry that we've missed our intended second speaker because I believe his input was going to be much more structured within the Africa Lex experience. I was going broader, so please allow me to do that. Uh, perhaps if he does join us, we may still get that input. Uh, for me, I've participated, as, as Becky said, in mentorship in a wide variety of contexts and disciplines. Uh, so I've done it in the workplace, uh, at the universities. I'm currently at Wits University and, um, and UCT in South Africa, where I do have a number of students that I both supervise and some mentor. I've done it in journals. I'll actually give one example of that, uh, as well as in communities. And uh, I was really excited when Africa Licks took up to do this study. Uh, because for me, it was um, important that the issue is taken up seriously, not just having sort of a casual or a tick box uh, uh, idea of what a mentorship program is, but because it's really crucial to the mission of, of IND learning and growth in Africa, you know, especially for a network uh, and a field that's fundamentally about competence building, uh, which is what the LICS are. So I'd really like to congratulate and acknowledge this as a very progressive move, I think, in prioritizing uh, mentorship as an important vehicle. Uh, or instrument uh, and, and really on producing this kind of a paper. So, so well done. Uh, so I thought from my experience, I would um, touch on or emphasize a few points uh, that relate to the paper based on practical experience. I thought that might be useful. Uh, and I wanted to start by saying that um, it would seem to me that what the paper emphasizes and what the findings seems to suggest people also appreciated was the idea that you need to have a deliberately and clearly designed program. Uh, the idea of just mentoring, which many people talk about quite casually, is not a given good or value add. Um, I, in my, my career, and for many of you perhaps who uh, also have a bit more experience, um, I, I hear a lot of people coming up to me saying, can you mentor me? Uh, could you please mentor me? Would you be my mentor? And I often have to respond by asking people what they are actually asking for, what their expectations and commitments are to that. Uh, and then also obviously to, con to consider my own capacity to take it on because mentorship, while it can be incredibly powerful, even life-changing, can also take up a lot of time and create a lot of frustration on both sides. And I have been, and maybe some of you have also been in rather bad mentorship relationships and situations. And so it's quite important that we consider what a deliberate approach does to mitigate that. Uh, my sense also, and maybe it's reflected in the kinds of areas where people were asking for emphasis, is that in the innovation and development space specifically, my experience uh, 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 over the past maybe decade or so is also that there's a particular challenge of having people coming in from various disciplines. Uh, and I think sometimes having a tendency to feel lost, you know, whether it's lost in the theory, um, I, I'm partly engaged at a business school where you've also got lots of people who are very good at what they do, but don't necessarily come from a background in conducting social research. So, you know, research in the social sciences. So a lot of frustration when you are expert in something, but you're perhaps cast into a space where you're trying to grapple with a, a language, a theory framework that perhaps themselves are not really all that clear. Um, uh, uh, you feel, uh, challenged and maybe you're willing to learn, but I think there's a particular difficulty in that sort of a context versus if one was perhaps just mentoring people in a traditional field where people did their bachelors in that same field and are coming up along the line. So, so my point is just that I think there is a particular issue there. 
Um, I think also when people then talk about mentorship, it tends to get mixed up with a range of other things. Uh, people sometimes are asking for mentorship, but actually what they're looking for is supervision or supplementation or supervision, but also all kinds of other things. Some people are looking for training or you're gonna teach them something or coaching, some want networking, some want career guidance or actual literal job seeking. Some people need sponsorship. Some people are looking for friends. And it's very important to distinguish between all of these things because mentorship can't actually fulfill all of those requirements. Uh, and obviously the pressure it then puts on mentors becomes tremendous. Uh, keeping in mind that mentors also have jobs. Um, mentors are also in a career progression often and, and maybe are themselves being mentored, have other accountabilities. So I think it's really important that, you know, it's a bit, I, I was thinking about this and thinking it's a bit like being a parent. I have two teenagers right now and I'm not saying that mentorship is like parenthood, but there's something there about you know, you can't keep telling people that being a mentor is hard, but it, it, it is hard as well. And even the mentor is learning and they're trying to do their best. And sometimes they're frustrated, they're feeling exploited and underappreciated. Uh, and so one is trying to support somebody uh, in, a, in, in maybe a relationship where they themselves don't necessarily have uh, all of the resources and support that they require. So that brings me actually to my second point. So all of that, I think, was just about this overarching issue of needing to have a deliberate program that is really making sense of that rather complex environment. Um, so my second point was really around, if you're having something that has structure to it, I think training and support for both parties becomes very important. Uh, and a, a clear reference point on this for me was uh, many years ago, as part of a structured mentorship program at so for scientific and industrial research here. Uh, and I really felt that one of the most valuable things is that anybody who went into the program first actually got some training and not just the mentee, uh, the mentors as well, and there were some support materials and also some indications of where you could go for support as you went along the way. For me, it was very important in acknowledging that, in fact, it's not an intuitive thing. I mean, some of us might intuitively just be good and better than others at doing that, but, but, but really there is a need for support and for training or at least some interventions to make sure that concepts are clear, how you set expectations is clear, maybe even ideas about how you organize the relationship and how you manage certain issues, what principles or parameters may need to be put in place. I think very helpful when a program can do that and, and I'm hoping that's something that can be thought about. I think the communication piece is very important and that has to go, that has to do with being deliberate. So if you're deliberate and you've designed something, it's important that everybody can see and understand what that framework is. Uh, and so obviously the training can also help. I also think that there needs to be some sort of an opt-out clause because we also, uh, I've been, and maybe some of you have also been in these mentorship relationships that just kind of go into a slow fade, you know, you just disappear over the horizon. There's no clear end to, to the mentorship. And, and, and I think that's something that's worth addressing and designing into a program. Um, it was interesting in the survey where it looked at platforms that people considered for mentorship. I thought it was interesting, maybe even a bit curious that um, there wasn't a very big priority put on the idea of net networking among the mentees themselves. I think it was a fairly low rated area, but I really think that's potentially very important. And I would really encourage looking into that because um, I've seen it probably when I was doing, best when I was doing my, uh, my PhD work and there was um, a sort of a collective uh, among those of us who were uh, conducting our PhDs at the time. Um, but I think there's something in that peer support that also allows mentees to learn from each other about what experiences other people are having and how perhaps they can engage better or differently. Um, so I would think that even if it's something quite passive, like online communities, a WhatsApp group, or LinkedIn group that's, that's, that's temporary. Uh, there's something I think, and I've seen it in my workplace as well, that I think it's quite useful sometimes to actually have people who are on a journey together to have peer-to-peer -to -peer engagement and support, and perhaps for the mentors as well. I, I've never had that, actually. I'd really welcome it, but perhaps for the mentors as well. So I think that's something from a platform perspective uh, might be interesting to look at. Uh, I picked up from the paper the idea that there was this push for both face-to-face -face and virtual engagements. And obviously, while that is ideal, and I think Anne mentioned this, uh, I mean, COVID has sort of eradicated a lot of the face-to-face -face possibility. And I think we are learning that we can increasingly engage, maybe not fully effectively, but reasonably effectively digitally as well. And this may be part of our reality post-COVID. So I do think that that's a space where we're going to have to explore options, understand possibilities. And obviously there's a lot of 
prospect there as well to address some of the cost issues because uh, I suppose the more virtual, perhaps the more efficient from a cost perspective. But I I'm not one to do away with the need for face-to-face, -face, but, but, but just to acknowledge that that might not really be an option in, in some cases. And we might learn um, even hybridize uh, different ways of doing things. Um, I wanted to point out maybe two areas that I didn't see discussed quite as much in the paper, although it was alluded to, I think, in the presentation. Um, the one was around um, the matching or selection of mentors to mentees, and maybe it's not something one could have asked in the survey, but I do wonder, and I'll come to that uh, when I just give a quick little example uh, about whether that's an issue. Do we interrogate enough the qualities or characteristics of mentor, mentees or mentors? You know, is there something like being mentorship fit, like you should or shouldn't participate? Um, is there something about the effectiveness of the combination or the matching of mentors to mentees? Are there criteria or ways to think about that? Uh, along some of the dimensions I think that were raised, you know, north south, are there gender issues? Are there uh, uh, um, generational issues? I I'm not sure, but I, I, do, I do get a sense that maybe there's uh, uh, something to be learned from that. And, and I'll give an example in the case. Uh, and the second one that I think almost comes out organically from the findings of the paper is around the uh, idea that ongoing feedback or evaluation of this kind might be very important for a mentorship program that's going to have to learn and evolve over time. Because if we want to be you know, responsive and talk about flexibility and being contextual and being adaptable, then obviously all of that speaks to the need to learn and perhaps be reflexive uh, with the program over time. Uh, and so I think that's potentially something that one would have to build into uh, an Africa Lix mentorship program so that this act of feedback in all of those different platforms and um, with all of the different activities that one creates access to, that there's a very deliberate uh, process of, of sort of tracking and learning from that, possibly improving the program then over time. So I thought I'd close with a very short um, example that, that's current. Uh, I'm, I'm currently involved with a journal where we've uh, uh, undertaken a special issue on women uh, in sort of urban real estate and development. So not quite, you know, I and D, but maybe more the D than, than the I, although many of the papers in fact are about uh, innovation. Uh, and we were doing this special issue around women mainly because um, uh, we found, and I believe Africlix also often finds this, that one struggles to, particularly women in the South, uh, uh, to really get adequate representation and to see, and, and, and to see a real strengthening there. Uh, and I've really seen in the approach we took to the journal, which wasn't just to call to women from the South, to sub in fact, women from Africa specifically, to submit to the journal. It was also to offer a mentorship program that went with that. Uh, we've seen a probably 80 to 90% improvement in the quality of papers uh, uh, in terms of in increasing their publishability in our journal, in other journals, uh, from these emerging female academics. Um, and I can actually write or very clearly juxtapose that to the experience I'm having on another international journal uh, on, on, on regional development issues where we have struggled to even preserve 20 to 30% inclusion of women and from geographically diverse places because they get dropped. Uh, they get dropped uh, in the absence of any deliberate intent to include them, uh, but also based on any deliberate support through mentorship to really get the papers up to a standard. So we, for example, uh, through the efforts of a few of us, encourage the inclusion of more women. Uh, and then in a blind process, most of them got dropped and there wasn't any fallback to say that there was a mentorship possibility because we actually think we ought to be investing into growing certain people. But what I've seen on the one then where we are offering the mentorship for, for African women um, is that, uh, like I said, there's been the big improvement, but there's also conditions, you know, uh, it's been important for the mentees to plan the mentorship into their work plan. So if you're the kind of person who does things at the last minute and then you continue to do that when somebody's trying to support you, it's very difficult because there's not enough time allowed for the support. Uh, we've also observed that it's really important that both sides become as clear as possible, as early as possible about exact areas of support. Otherwise there's a risk that your mentor becomes like a copy editor uh, and that's not a very good use, I think, of the relationship. Uh, mentees sometimes have to juggle between the inputs and roles of their supervisor, because they have an academic supervisor often, uh, and the mentor, in this case, who's mentoring you towards doing a paper, and sometimes the feedback is not the same, and, and, and that's been a bit of a challenge uh, on a couple of them. Um, the mentees also need to be committed and take the lead on communication. So we had more than one instance of uh, sometimes, you know, mentees saying that the supervisor didn't support, but the supervisor would say, well, I haven't heard from this person 
months and in months. Um, and so again, because it maybe wasn't a, a structured enough program, maybe it wasn't clear who takes the lead on communication. I'm very, I'm a very strong believer, by the way, that the mentees should take the lead on communication. But if that's not made clear, then there becomes that question of who's waiting for who to, to, to do what. Um, the flexibility and context really did come up. Uh, even with, I, I also had a mentee and in my own mentorship situation, you know, we had COVID happen this year. Uh, my mentee was from Nigeria and we had the SARS situation happen there and a number of really horrible, you know, you know issues. Uh, she was facing pressure because of the COVID and these other issues at the university. So I think again, uh, it's useful that the mentorship space does allow uh, and maybe require the room to be a bit empathetic and supportive through that. Uh, and unfortunately, we've been able to, to make it through. Now, in the case of that journal, the, the, the face-to-face, if it ever is to happen now, uh, in the conference actually would come later. So we haven't actually ever met. Uh, the mentorship preceded any opportunity for face-to-face -face between the mentor and the mentee. But I'm very sure that if that ever happens, I think there'll be a very rich and interactive engagement between the mentees and the mentors because of the big rapport that's already been built and working together and successfully, hopefully, publishing these papers. Uh, and maybe that's where some of those other needs, you know, the friendship, the networking, uh, sponsoring coffee, or whatever it is, uh, maybe that's when that gets to happen. And so I don't actually think it's been really problematic that, uh, in a way, the mentorship has prece preceded the opportunity to actually meet. I do think the issue of matching has come up. Uh, uh, in this case, we were deliberately trying to, because it was women, we felt that the, the priority was to actually match them up with women, but we'd also matched up with some men. Uh, and that's been interesting. And I think it's something we might analyze uh, just from this special issue going forward to see whether that's made a difference for people. Because my suspicion just anecdotally is that maybe it has uh, across gender lines and also culture, so sort of where people come from. Uh, that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. And I know I've been mentored in all sorts of ways from people from all sorts of places, but I do think it's something we might want to do a bit of study into and just see whether there's some, you know, science to at least watching out for certain dynamics and making sure that people get the most out of the experience. So uh, I'm really excited to see that the other speaker has, <laughs> has appeared and I'm sure we'll hear from him just now, Ned. Uh, so I'll hand back to you, Becky. Those are just my reflections, I think, on the paper and the exercise. Uh, and just maybe throwing in a little bit of my practical experience with um, uh, things I've observed and maybe areas where academics might be able to, to think on as we develop the mentorship activities. Thank you. Thanks, Kesti. No, that was really useful. I think it worked well um, in terms of uh, moving from, from Anne's presentation around structure and outcomes and, and content um, and really, really hearing some some experiences. So, um, uh, Professor Lorenz, thank you very much for joining. Uh, apologies for for the the time mix up, uh, but great to great to have you with us. Yeah, I must um, apologize for that. I'm sorry if you have um, got the time confused. Um, I'm going to make this be sort of a personal, I guess, um, presentation talking about my own um, experiences with a different. Um, uh, mentorship. Does everybody hear me? Because I can put on a microphone if it's not coming in clear. I think we can hear you. I can anyway. <laughs> you can hear me, okay. Um, so I have a little PowerPoint which I'll pull up just to go through. It won't take long and I hope it'll also maybe raise some questions. I can just find it. Does everybody see this now? Yes, we can see. It's okay. All right. So I, I I'm afraid I, I missed. Um, there might be a little repetition, so I missed uh, Anne's presentation. And um, I, there, you know, I, there's three different types of mentoring activities I've been involved in, which are all through Africa Lakes, and um, two of them are through Albert University. And in my view, why they they do have, of course, some broad overlapping objectives. There are some specific, there are specific different um, objectives, and I think they present different challenges. So I'll try to bring, I thought I'd talk a little bit about those differences and common points. So there's the, as Anne has probably already gone through, there's the PhD Business and Fellowship Program, all board, there's these, uh, the short-term mentorship activities, which we did a, a first round at the um, Ghana Global X Conference, and we're planning 
uh, to do it again for Costa Rica. And then, um, and then there's the postdoc fellowship program, which is a pilot program that I that's, this had one, one batch of three postdocs and is uh, actually coming to uh, finishing up now the two, two year period. So obviously the main objective, it seems to me, is to help PH, uh, the fellowship programs to help PhD candidates from low, low middle income countries to um, complete their PhDs and prepare for a career in the field of um, innovation and development. It could be in academia, it could be in the private sector, it could also be in government administrations. The, this is probably repetitive, but it's just to sort of quickly remind you, the, it's for students that have completed their first year of PhD. There's a five month study period at Aalborg. This is financed by CETA. And the student is matched with um, a senior scholar um, at Aalborg, usually, could sometimes Lund. And often there's a junior scholar, so you could have two, uh, two um, uh, mentors. And then the, uh, the, at the kickoff, the home supervisor is invited to visit Aalborg and, and that we have, a, we have an exchange. Um, well, I think when you look at the challenges that I've experienced in being involved in this for several years, it depends on um, the stage at which the student is at in his or her thesis. So you have the case of early PhDs who have um, defined their subject, but in some cases haven't really begun work on a literature review or a conceptual framework. And then there are cases of more advanced PhDs mm -hmm. and they, um, they may have engaged in some data collection. So, I mean, in both cases, I would just say for both of these, I think the face-to-face, -face, and this is of course a problem we have now with COVID. So, um, I mean, a close match, I think this is something that's common in all the mentoring I've done. And I would argue it's important that you have a good match between the uh, mentor and mentee in terms of the mentor's experience, background, and, and, and the uh, focus of the, um, the research project. And uh, But um, I think also in this first, when you have an early stage PhD that you're trying to mentor, I think the, 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 the linkages, the connections with the, with the home supervisor become even more important because if you're working across purposes in terms of setting, uh, trying to um, establish a good conceptual framework and so on, it, then it's very confusing for the uh, student and it isn't very successful. So I would say this um, interaction and bringing the home supervisor into the process is, uh, is a very important ingredient for making this succeed. Um, when you have students, a student that in my experience is at a later stage, um, the, the interaction is important, but maybe less so because the basic direction of the thesis is set. And our role, at least as I see it, is basically to help improve the chapters, to sort out problems that may, may be present in terms of analyzing the data, um, whether the approach is qualitative, quantitative, or mixed. And um, it's, a, it's a different kind of problem that you would get compared. To. And I've um, you know, worked very, uh, intensively with students at the early stages and um, you have to be patient because these these things take time. Um, on the short-term mentorship activities that I've uh, that what we what we applied a program in Ghana um, in this case the student has a paper um, the person the, the uh, typically PhD or it could be actually um, um, early career a researcher. There was a paper in preparation that's fairly well advanced because you only have a couple months to work with the, um, the mentee to uh, prepare the paper for, for Global X, it's for a Global X conference submission. So your role is really to help, you know, improve the paper to do whatever, what you can do to make sure the paper is, is um, accepted uh, for oral presentation. And then in that case, I think this probably ain't explained, the mentees, um, the students traveling or the person's traveling expenses are covered. And we had a pre-conference meeting in order to uh, every, all the uh, mentees involved would present and get feedback before they actually um, present their papers at the conference. Um, well, one challenge is of course is linked to, the paper really needs to be at a pretty advanced stage because there's only a, we only really have a couple months 
um, two, two and a half months to, to work together. Uh, again, the, the match, I think, is a very important ingredient for this, this working. And I think a bigger challenge that I've faced than maybe others is moving beyond the, um, the short-term goal and trying to establish a longer-term mentor-mentee relationship, which might focus, for example, on the, um, on the development. If it's a, in one case, I had a master's student, so it was basically trying to um, encourage and help the other person uh, develop a PhD program a project. Um, of course, the problem may be um, you, you may have ideas about uh, a good innovation related uh, project, but if that can't be supported at the home institution, then, it, then of course this is, this is not gonna work. Uh, just a few remarks about the postdoc program, which is ongoing uh, the first, um, the first time at Alborg right now. Um, there were uh, three, um, uh, it's a pilot program with three low, low middle income country candidates who were selected competitively for this. It is, was designed to have two three month periods of study in Denmark. Um, and the outputs here, because we're, we're talking about postdocs are much more um, ambitious, um, possibly a joint amongst the three um, postdocs, a joint book or special journal issue. And they are, um, they, they commit themselves to working on a fundable project proposal that will help support development in their own institution, um, an innovation hub, hub in the field of, of innovation development. Um, and other, other things that are involved are participation in activities, conferences, and other kinds of activities to improve skills as a principal investigators. Um, well, again, I come back to the same point. I think there's always this question of when you're when you're matched up with um, you you this again it becomes extremely important because you're dealing with more advanced students who are working at um, who've already have experience um, publishing, and your your role is is quite is is sort of helping the it could be helping to improve a paper in some cases, but I think it's it's a sort of um how to help the uh, young uh, early research careers sort of consolidate their positions as IND scholars. And this could mean that you're also, um, you know, some of the some of the work we've done is because our three, three um, postdocs are working on a special issue and learning how to coordinate and work on um, editing a special issue or a book or not things that, um, you know, that are necessarily learned that they aren't, you don't acquire those skills except by practice and experience. So we spent a lot of time uh, with our three postdocs, you know, working on this special uh, journal issue and helping them to um, know how to select, evaluate, and um, proceed, move forward on um, getting the issue uh, ready for publication. Um, so that's, that's a different kind of um, task than with um, the, the, uh, the doctoral students. Well, I think if I would say there's a challenge, it's more, I guess you could say a challenge for this type of program. Um, the mentees, they're drawn from a pool of very promising young career researchers. They've already have um, likely to have had um, involved in administrative and teaching responsibilities at their own home institutions. And they're the students of a high caliber. Um, they've shown promise. And so I think one of the issues is questions of time. Um, that it's fine while the postdocs are were in all board with, with the ability to work on their, but once they're back in their home institutions, there's inevitably pressures to get involved in a whole lot of activities around administration, institution building which means that it becomes very hard to carve out the time for research that was anticipated. So I would say this is something that has to be addressed and it's, um, it's, it seems to be the case for all of our postdocs. So just to conclude with my, my views, um, I could also, I've, I've stressed uh, the good match. I think there is in, important to have some face-to-face -face contact Initially, I think that's been you know important in terms of developing um, the mentor-mentee relationship. 
I think, well, there has to be a high degree of motivation on the part of both, um, because particularly once you're working at a distance and online over time, um, there has to be a, a high degree of motivation to keep, keep the relationship going. It's too easy to sort of lose track of each other. So I would say these are kind of important factors. Um, there was this question that um, we were looking at a bigger question that Anne had raised um, about, you know, the, the scope of these programs to um, contribute in an important way to developing a critical mass of IND scholars in Africa. I think both the PhD and the postdoc programs do have potential. Um, I think it's a lot, we've got to take a longer term, a long term perspective, but it shouldn't be something that should be just in terms of how many mentees do we have? Because the idea is that um, if we can support uh, some of these um, students to go to start pursuing academic careers, then they can ultimately, I think, you know, be important in terms of developing master degree programs and in IND in their institutions. And that will then feed in to the PhD level because one, one thing I think we, we have seen is that, you know, often the, um, there isn't enough preparation in terms of orienting people towards IND prior to the point at which they choose and they start developing their PhD activities. And if they've already on track on something that's um, not really IND, then it can be hard to um, bring that IND dimension fully into the thesis. So I would say this is a long-term perspective and that we will, we should think of it that way and not expect the, um, the critical mass to be um, created overnight. So that's, that's, that's all I had to say, thanks. Great, thanks, Ned. Let me um, see if I can uh, get rid of the PowerPoint. <laughs> so if you can That'd stop sharing your screen, that would be great. Um, so uh, please keep uh, your questions coming on on the chat. Um, thanks, Ned, for for your your intervention. Um, there was uh, quite a nice um, complementarity um, between some of the things that you were saying and, and some of the comments that um, that uh, Gessie had raised, um, particularly around matching of, of mentors and, and mentees, um, the issue of, of outcomes and, and goals was something that that Anne had had raised and, and Gessie to, to a certain extent. Um, and um, I, I particularly liked your, your last intervention around um, how this plays into a, a broader set of discussions around building up the field of, of innovation and development. And I, I think it's, it's worth mentioning for, for those people who are not um, kind of uh, that, that aware of what Africa Lakes does um, and, and its specific focus I mean, the, the field of innovation and development studies as a, as a multidisciplinary um, a field of study is, is very new in, 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 um, in African settings. And, and many African universities do not have um, established um, fields of study in this area, which is why this level of, of mentorship is, is so important um, because often people are, are, are housed in disciplinary um, departments of engineering or uh, or economics or uh, or business studies and they you know they they don't have um a, a dedicated opportunity to uh to to get involved in 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 this type of of research um so really um useful we've heard from from three three speakers now um it's time to to hear from from yourselves please keep the the questions coming um and uh, Gessie and Ned, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five questions so far. Um, so let me um, pose those to you now, and then I'll ask Anne to give some um, some initial feedback on those. You don't need to answer to all of them. Um, perhaps choose two or three, and, and between yourselves, you you'll be able to uh, to address them all. So um, the first question uh, we received was around. Uh, the effectiveness of um, the mentorship activities. How do we, ha how effective have, have we been in our mentorship activities? Uh, the second question, uh, which actually Gessie um, uh, um, alluded to, 
and, and answered partly in her presentation was the issue of gender and uh, gender issues in mentorship. Um, how, how have we found issues of gender and, and how are we addressing uh, the, the lack of, of women in, in academia in our mentorship activities? Um, the third uh, question was uh, around um, how we define mentorship as opposed to supervision. Um, I think it's worth saying at this point to, again, to those that are, are less familiar with the program, the uh, Visiting Fellows Program um, and the PhD Academies are not formally attached to any um, programs within African universities. So these are additional extras that, that, um, that students um, and, and postdocs sign up to. Um, so there was a question of effectiveness, a question around gender, a question around supervision versus mentorship, and a question of authorship and recognition. So how you manage the, the roles and responsibilities uh, between mentors and, and mentees so that everybody gets, gets something out of, the, uh, out of the exercise. So let's, let's start with those questions first. So Anne, do you want to um, uh, give us some, some initial feedback on those? Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Becky. Thank you, uh, the the participants. I think I can see two questions on the chat that I think I would want to um, address, and then I'll leave the others to Gacy and to uh, Lawrence, especially the one on supervision because I think they are more uh, suited to. I think they are more experienced in terms of supervision. Uh, the question that Dauphin is raising. I think I should post that question to you, Dauphine. You are one of the very first beneficiary of Africa Rick's uh, research uh, activities. You came to Mozambique. I remember you were in that uh, group and uh, I can argue that you are the, the pioneers of, of Africa Rick's uh, mentorship uh, program. Uh, maybe perhaps that time we were not very, very uh, clear on whether what we were doing was mentorship or not, but now I think we are clear. Uh, progressively, we have seen what we are doing is actually uh, uh, contributing to mentorship. So I think that question can be best answered by you guys who have benefited from African activities, and uh, you can tell us whether our mentorship program has been effective or not. But having said that, I, I would argue that uh, what we are doing in terms of uh, trying to build a critical mass of, uh, of scholars in innovation and development, and picking mentorship as a tool that can actually help us to achieve this, we, are, we can argue that uh, this has, uh, in, a, in, in a small way, this has actually contributed to, to that. And the reason why I'm saying this is because, uh, as Becky said, this is a new area. So we have to deal with the fact that the area we are dealing with is new, that's number one. And number two, we have also to uh, grapple with the fact that uh, we have to draw on uh, expertise from outside, uh, uh, from the north, to be able to help us to undertake this. So we can argue that uh, this far, for the 10 years that, uh, almost uh, seven years that uh, Africa has been in existence, we can, we can argue that uh, we have uh, uh, fairly contributed to that particular goal. And of course, it's, uh, as uh, Lawrence Edward said, uh, building a capacity in that area is a long-term goal. It, we cannot achieve it uh, within a very short time. That's why we are looking at the short term and also the long term. And we have also realized that we cannot actually do this on our own. We need to collaborate with other right-minded uh, uh, individuals, right-minded institutions, which are doing this so that we can combine efforts and draw on synergies to be able to achieve that. Uh, and the other thing that I would want to mention is that uh, IND uh, area, as much as it is multidisciplinary, it is cutting across a number of thematic areas. And, and we can argue that within specific sectoral uh, areas, we, we can argue we have managed to, uh, uh, to impact on what is happening. Uh, and and, and uh, I'm sure uh, looking forward, I know uh, we will be able to achieve much more. 
but it will depend, it will depend on uh, the, those who are uh, 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 given the opportunity to be trained like yourself and others in different institutions. It depends on you. You can actually become a bus ambassadors wherever you are. Dauphin, uh, where you are, you can become an ambassador and the others who have joined today and the others we have been trying to, uh, to, to, to engage with. So the second question, I think is a bit more tricky. Uh, and thank you for asking. I, I know you are passionate about uh, uh, gender issues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, I, and, and I can agree, I can uh, identify with uh, your concern about how to integrate uh, gender approaches into IND mentorship. Uh, I would argue that uh, uh, issues of gender are factored into the questions that uh, we ask when we are undertaking innovation uh, research. Uh, you remember when I was uh, presenting, I said that in the innovation studies, uh, we do ask questions that are uh, relevant to this particular question. We ask uh, uh, questions around uh, how does uh, innovation take place. We also ask questions about uh, who does the innovation and how can the marginalized uh, youth, the young people, women, people with disability, how can they be, you know, uh, engaged in the innovation process? So, in our research uh, uh, approach. Uh, uh, innovation studies research approach, these questions are actually asked. And any researcher is able to uh, provide for, you know, uh, questions uh, and uh, methodologies that, at, that would answer this particular question. So I would argue, yes, there is a way you can integrate uh, uh, gender uh, issues into a research uh, uh, process by asking the right questions. And of course, uh, coming up with the methodological tools that would be able to uh, answer those questions. So it is possible to do that. But, but I, I would argue that uh, for, for such a, a specific aspect of, uh, of research, we need to engage much more and uh, provide you know, those uh, specific tailor-made uh, training that would address some of these issues, perhaps in the structured program that tries to bring together those who are interested in some of these issues into one group and then we can provide the training. So that is a very key question and I'm glad that uh, you people are actually asking how we can do this. So I'll hand over to the uh, to my other co-panelists to, to be able to address some of these other questions. Over to you, Becky, to guide. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Gessie, please, any comments on feedback? Yes, so I feel like I can only comment because some of these I think are asked asking about Africa Lake specifically. So for example, on the co-authorship uh, and maybe on these provisions, so maybe as some of those we might circle back to Anne, but if I can just comment briefly on three things. One is that I really do hope somebody takes on this question around uh, gender, uh, because uh, especially, you know, the experience I was sharing between these two journals I'm on right now, uh, and if you look at what's happening in many corporate workplaces where they're beginning to take much more seriously some of the gendered differences in the workplace that often lead to men advancing at a different pace. And when one really bothers to interrogate it, one begins to see that there are sometimes differences in how people communicate. Uh, uh, who knows, maybe we are referencing material differently and maybe we are asking research questions in different ways that sometimes don't appear to pass the bar. And maybe it's a gender difference. I don't know, and I don't know who's asking these questions, but I, I really think from this experience I had, I really think it's worth uh, taking a bit further and might be interesting to see whether the uh, uh, impacts in terms of uh, the mentorship space. Um, I wanted to comment briefly also on the supervision, but again, I can only give my own more anecdotal reflection. Perhaps there are more formal uh, distinctions that, uh, that Africa Lix or others make. I think in my experience, because I do supervise and mentor, uh, for me, the supervision is much more about um, really uh, almost a directive coaching, training, managerial relationship where I'm trying to get somebody to complete their degree, whether it's a master's or a PhD student. Now, it may involve aspects of mentorship, which I see as more developmental, uh, more, more, if you want more soft guidance, you know, sometimes counseling, sometimes cheerleading and, uh, uh, and, and that sort of thing. It's more consultative perhaps where the power relationship maybe is not as explicit as it is in a supervisory one. So for me, those would be the differences. And I actually think that for a person who's studying, uh, I don't think it's a bad idea to have both actually, because uh, at least for me in my own life, I feel I've gotten different things out of having a supervisor. 
uh, and sometimes a mentor maybe doesn't task drive you as hard as you might need to be driven. So if you're very disciplined, maybe you don't need it. But people like me did need to be supervised <laughs> just so that they could <laughs> get to do the work. So um, so there's, there's, I think, a slightly different uh, relationship there. And I think they're both important. But the challenge that I've experienced, like I shared, is sometimes how to juggle and understand that they are different and, and, and they may not always be guiding in the same direction, which can be a bit uh, um, uh, confusing. Uh, I also wanted to co comment very briefly, again, I don't know what the rules are in Africa, Lakes, but on the co-authorship, I have co-authored in other contexts with mentees, but I must say, I feel it changes the relationship. Uh, 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 because at, when they maybe, I don't know, again, it could be a personal issue. I don't know, maybe others with experience can comment on whether they feel it's all the same. But I feel for me when I'm writing with somebody versus while I'm on the sideline trying to guide them on what they're doing, I feel I engage differently myself. Uh, and so it's probably something to consider uh, is, uh, I suppose, does it make a difference? And if it does, is that a difference that's suited to what the mentorship program is about? Because it can change priorities. Uh, it can also begin to co-share responsibility for something where if I'm just a mentor, actually you are responsible. I'm just supporting you. But if we're now both in it, then obviously I carry some of the responsibility and that's something slightly different. And I would also worry a little bit about the possibility, obviously, of that old exploitation issue where maybe the person feels they're being exploited for their labor, which is never a comfortable space. So I'll just stop there. Great, thanks. Ned, do you have any comments or, or thoughts on these issues? You're muted, Ned. Okay. Yeah, just a few comments. Um, I, I think I largely on the sort of supervision and mentorship, I think what Geki said was just precisely right. It's a different relationship. Um, you don't have the same sort of responsibility as you do when you're supervising somebody's thesis as their main supervisor. It's a bit more flexible, a bit more open. Um, there is also the fact that since there is a main supervisor, as a as a mentor, you have to be, as I mentioned, um, sensitive to the relationship that the, that the mentee has with the main supervisor, and this and and brings an, an element into your activities, which of course you don't have to worry think so much about when you're a main supervisor. There are obviously overlaps. I mean, some of the work can be you know going over chapters and suggesting how they can be revised, but I think all in all, it um, it tends to be um, I find it less hierarchical and less. Um, um, structured, and I, I, I find that quite rewarding personally. But um, it's, it's it's different. Um, on the authorship, um, I don't see in principally. I could imagine, particularly with the postdoc students, that we could engage in some. Um, I haven't done so. Uh, Co-authorship. Um, I think there you need to be. There need to be sensitive about yes this question of exploitation about um, you know I think we go into this men 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 mentoring not not for that kind of reward um, at least I don't it's uh, it's because um, it's rewarding to be involved in discussing I learn a lot and I try to give a lot but I don't see it as a vehicle for um, publications but I don't preclude it absolutely. Um, in 2016, as you can see, Olusa is here. I was informally um, helping out on a, a special IND number. And then finally, I actually did come in and help um, write up the introduction to the special issue. And um, so I, my name is, is in there. Um, that came at the end and it wasn't really anticipated. I think probably it could change the interaction. Um, and it makes it different from what um, a, I see the mentor mentee relationship that I've been involved in would be because suddenly you, you have um, a responsibility that's somewhat different. And also you may be putting pressure on the mentee to do certain things to get the article and ready for you. You know, it, it, I think it could, could change the relationship, but I don't see it as being um, something that should be absolutely um, excluded. Although I haven't, um, at the Africa Lakes mentorship, I haven't been involved in any co-authorship. Um, so I think that's pretty much all I have to say. I mean, 
I guess on the gender, we, as uh, Anne probably mentioned, we we tried in the selection process to give priority to bring to um, you know recruiting women, um, and that's um, you know which is part of the effort to increase the number of female IND scholars. But um, um, that's, I think, appropriate and should be continued. So that's all I have to say. Great. Uh, thanks, Ned. Thanks, Gessie. Um, and do you have any follow up with regards to the, the authorship or the, the um, supervision question? I mean, on the, the um, just then, um, I think you also had actually asked whether Grace from um, from the Acad um, African Academy of Sciences would like to, to say anything um, with the, with regards to the experiences of of um, AAS and mentorship. So I don't know, Grace, whether you would like to come in here at all now. Uh, hi, Becky, and hello, everyone. Apologies, I want to switch on my videos so that you have better connection. Thanks to all of you for a fantastic work you're doing on mentorship. I've learned a lot from the sharing. Uh, just to share a few points, I work at the African Academy of Sciences where I coordinate a mentoring scheme for largely post PhD researchers. Ours is structured, um, so I could share a few tips if you ever decide to move in that direction of a structured and yet a virtual mentoring scheme. Uh, I was interested to hear about how you differentiate uh, supervision and mentoring. For us, we've been very specific with our mentees receiving mentorship from people who are not directly working with them, simply because we feel their additional support that individuals require where, when deadlines are not involved regarding to specific deliverables uh, in their career. And also perhaps it's because we are working with post PhD researchers who are either on their first or second postdoc or they're already becoming independent researchers. So the support that they're looking for is very, very specific. Mm -hmm. um, one of the speakers mentioned the issue of matching and enrollment. That has been quite a lesson for us. Uh, the first year we marched uh, manually, that meant we had to know all our mentors and our mentees. It helped because we knew all our mentees. So it was much easier for us to find the mentors. But as we grow, we have found that having a platform that can enable us to use an algorithm to ease the matching process is very helpful. But then for us, the role of a mentoring coordinator in managing a mentoring scheme is very, very important. So I found myself wanting even to spend more time even after the algorithm has helped with the matching process, still connecting with the mentors and mentees. I think it's always helpful when both mentors and mentees know that this one part person at the institution whom I can always refer to if I'm having challenges with the mentoring relationship that I am part of. So that's one thing that uh, I would share with you. Another thing that I thought that was quite impressive about what you're doing is that your mentoring scheme is anchored on an ongoing program. And so you can actually set very specific uh, goals to be achieved with your mentees. Whereas for us, we are looking at the overall professional development and even personal development of our mentees and therefore asking them to set uh, career goals. So what we've been doing is that we run training, we call the master classes, where once we enroll our mentors and mentees, we take them through a master class on effective mentoring strategies. And during those master classes, we cover some of the essentials we, we feel they need to equip themselves to before they start connecting. And one of that is goal setting, because if you don't set the goal upfront, then that relationship will not really move. And that also enables you to build a rapport with your mentor. It also enables you to ensure that both of you can actually meet what you're expecting and you can manage expectations. We found those masterclasses really helpful. And I'll be happy to, to invite um, some of your mentors and mentees in future when we run them and when we have open slots for external mentors and mentees. Uh, another thing we cover on these masterclasses is 
some of the strategies, especially because you're using virtual platforms, the aspect of active listening and asking insightful questions, that too we have found is very helpful. And especially in our context here in Africa, where most of us who go through our academic institutions, they're quite hierarchical. We're not used to have, uh, asking questions to people who, who we think are seniors. So then we go through that and how you're actually able to ask questions, how you're able to provide feedback and receive feedback without thinking someone is ordering you. But just a few points to share and thanks so much for allowing me to say a few things. Over to you, Becky. Thanks, Grace. That's um, really useful. Um, and I, I think the, the point I've, I saw the, the masterclasses being advertised and um, I think the issue of training, which I think Gessie had raised, um, is, is, um, is a useful one that we, we should take forward. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's worth saying the issue around supervision versus mentorship, the, the model has changed a little um, in the Visiting Fellows Program as, as we've developed it over the years. So originally, that we, when we first started it, we didn't have the inclusion of the, the PhD supervisor um, in the discussions, um, particularly. I mean, sometimes it happened more ad hocly. Um, but in recent years, we've actually decided very concretely to engage with, uh, uh, with the, three, the three parties together um, and to ensure that um, there is a agreement on the goals and the tasks of the, men, the mentor at, um, at Ulberg University in that relationship, because it, it does throw up a, a whole set of um, additional issues um, when, when you have uh, that third party uh, in, in the relationship. Um, so we, we've learned from that and um, we do believe that now we are, it's, it's actually helping build more understanding and more awareness of the field as a whole, um, not just at, at the you know, at PhD student level, um, but also in a, in a wider faculty um, in engagement. Um, within within these uh, the universities in which our, our fellows are, are based, um, we have about four minutes left. Um, we did start a bit late, so I'm not sure whether people would would like to to, to continue on for a bit longer. Um, there are two uh, well one one question that Gessie had had asked of our, um, asked us. Um, which I think again it builds on the the, the issue around gender and um, and uh, and the relationship of of female versus male scholars within the field, um, and and that's around the selection criteria that we use for for mentorship, and whether we should we should think more seriously about about those that selection criteria. Um, I mean, I, I think the, for me, the gender question, I'm kind of moving out of my role as moderator here, um, is, a, is a really interesting one. And it relates to that, the, the broader pipeline issue, which, um, which Ned raised. And the fact that we just don't, we don't have a huge number of female uh, scholars in this field at the moment. Um, and so we do need to address that much earlier on, I think, um, even, even if we, if, if we, um, target underrepresented groups, not, not just in terms of gender, um, but also in terms of uh, perhaps geographical location as well, moving forward um, with, uh, with, with mentorship. Um, I think we have no other questions, um, although I do have a question myself for, for the panelists. Um, so unless there's anything else, I will ask this last question and it will be, will be the, the last the last question. Um, so my question goes back to the, the, the discussions we were having around the relative merits of online versus face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. um, mentorship. And um, I wanted to ask, I mean, as Gessie said, moving forward, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the whole way in which we interact is, is going to change and is already changing. Um, so I was wondering whether you thought that um, if we are unable to, and it's more cost effective, um, and we can have broader reach if we move away from face to face interaction, and we move to a, a higher level of, of online engagement, whether there's um, whether there is something around needing more online uh, and 
uh, virtual engagement. So uh, increased quantity of engagement um, rather than the depth of, of engagement that you get with a face-to-face -face, um, scenario. So something about the breadth and depth of face-to-face of -face versus online, um, online interaction. Um, and maybe when you answer that, you can also say any concluding comments that you, you want to, to make so that we can, we can wrap up in the next five minutes. Uh, are we going in the same order, Becky? So uh, you, uh, whoever would like to go first. So Gessie, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> Since I have the mic. Okay, thanks, 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 Becky. Um, wow, so I was just wondering as you were asking the question, Becky, and I think it's a good one. Uh, I wonder whether depth is the word I would use to describe what the difference is for me between face-to-face -face and, and, and virtual mentoring, because I'm actually thinking that um, th there's something qualitative that's different, obviously, between speaking to somebody and, you know, and typing with somebody, but I, I don't know if depth is the distinction, actually. Uh, first of all, in terms of frequency, uh, if I look at myself this year, I've probably uh, engaged more uh, with my mentees this year, perhaps because I've been conscious of not having the face-to-face. -face. So whereas face-to-face, -face, we may only have met you know, and uh, assuming if people, you know, around here in Johannesburg or in South Africa, maybe quarterly or maybe every second month. Uh, but now I felt compelled to keep up via WhatsApp and send an email now and then, are you okay? So a, a lot more frequent, in fact, engagement than usual. And then from a depth perspective, often, often with my mentees, I guess, besides the chats, and maybe that's maybe what one loses is the more sociable engagement i think when it comes to work I, I don't think the depth has really suffered from from being online versus being live so so i, I actually think it's doable and I, and I think what we probably need to do is to figure out what is it that one loses from the face-to-face -face and to find ways if possible to try and mitigate or or, or supplement for, for those aspects of the relationship uh, and so i'm hoping this is something we will think about more purposefully uh, um, now that we're in it. Uh, and maybe my closing remark in the same vein would be around the appreciation of the learning process around all of this. I think that it's really great that we have the academy to learn from. And I think Africa Licks, uh, as the hopefully as the mentorship programs continue, if we're, if we're purposeful about documenting the learning and really having an ongoing, maybe structured monitoring and evaluation framework around the mentorship itself, I think and really begin to learn a lot more about how to do this better and to make it more meaningful. So things like this, questions like this around uh, virtual versus face-to-face, -face, I think are perhaps things we can learn from practice and the experiences of people, what they feel they're lacking. Because I haven't asked the question actually to my mentees about what they feel they're lacking uh, or experiencing differently uh, on the virtual. I'm only commenting on my own experience. So I think let's learn let, let's get more competent by, 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 by studying what we're doing and then I think we'll get there. So thanks, Becky. Great. Uh, Ned, do you want to, to go next? Well, I've, um, I think we're all kind of learning how much we can actually accomplish virtually. And so we're, we've adapted and we're adjusting to it because of the circumstances of COVID. And, um, and it's true, you, um, some, sometimes there's actually more communication than in, in my interpersonal professional context than, than, than before. Um, and uh, perhaps because we all have got the habit of hopping on Zoom and, and so on. I've, um, I tend to feel that some initial face-to-face -face contact, I felt that way up to now, I maybe have to learn how to get around it, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a important as a sort of starting point because you sort of get to know each other in a way that you can't quite do when you when you're when your initial your own all your all your contacts are um on zoom or skype um it kind of helps i think establish and uh, make the relationship a bit more real um but once that initial face-to-face -face contact is sort of there well, i think you can go ahead and do a lot um on, online i guess we'll have to maybe learn how to maybe to have to learn how to get, get by without that, at least for the, the immediate future. Um, but I, I, I tend to feel that it, it does have something that can't be entirely replaced. Um, and I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure exactly what it is that we need to learn how to do online that to, to uh, 
but somehow it um, it establishes an interpersonal sort of relationship that that carries you through uh, into um, the interaction, which is just online. So I've 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 prized it, um, and up to now, um, with one exception, I've always had an opportunity to have at least some face-to-face -face contact with people that I'm. Uh, um, uh, mentoring, so this this may be a new challenge. It's, it's a very personal statement, but I'm not quite sure how to deal with this issue. Um, I'm hoping that we will get back to face to face. In fact, and I, I keep my faith that that will be the case within um, uh, another year, maybe, but or maybe less. I hope. We're planning for Costa Rica, so. And we're planning to have it in person, so maybe that's premature, but um, there will be seed of money that will support people from Africa going to Costa Rica. Uh, I believe it's still there, so perhaps you know there will be a renewal of the face-to-face -face kind of contacts. I certainly hope so. Thanks, Ned. Anne, would you like I, to? I think and we have, maybe I, because there's no time for me. I think I would argue that. Um, we actually need to, uh, the, the concept that Mama Muchi like using, we need to unlearn, you know? We need to, to rethink, you know, the, the, our perception about uh, uh, particular things that we have forget, gotten accustomed to doing. And one of them is uh, mentorship, because our perception mm -hmm. has been that uh, physical uh, interaction, particularly at the early stage of, uh, you know, our mentorship is usually key. Because there's a kind of, uh, you know, you are breaking the ice, you know, you are establishing a relationship. So I think we need to think about uh, what can be compromised if such a thing does not happen. And, and number two, also, I think uh, compromising of the depth, I think, has to be gauged in terms of uh, the expected uh, uh, goal. Uh, if uh, the expected goal of mentorship is to establish, you know, a long-term relationship that can probably lead into collaborative activities, you know, co-publishing and all that kind of stuff. Maybe the physical interaction is, is critical. The initial critical interaction might be critical. But as I said earlier, and it has been said by uh, Florence and uh, by Jesse, that we are actually learning. You know, there are many things that we don't know and we will have to just wait and see what works and what does not work. And we mm. do have the academy that we are experimenting with to see what is this that we are likely to, you know, to change uh, and whether it is something that is going to benefit us or something that we need to think about changing how we, we undertake uh, uh, the academies, uh, in, including the uh, visiting fellows program. Yeah, thanks. Back to you, Becky. Great. So uh, thank you, everybody. Um, can I ask that everybody who can turns on their camera just so that we can say goodbye to each other. Thank you all very much for participating and, and staying online. Um, it's, uh, I think it's been a really uh, useful and engaging discussion and certainly useful for us within the Secretariat in terms of um, learning and thinking about uh, the next stage of, of activities. Um, I can see everybody coming online. It's great to see so many it's familiar great, faces. Yes. Is that your faces. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's really nice. Don't get to see you all uh, regularly enough. So excellent. OK, so uh, thank you all very much. Um, have a wonderful day. And we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, webinar, which I think is uh, scheduled for the 9th of December. And uh, Pamela and Reggie, who is uh, joining, uh, who is here today, will be will be speaking along with others um, on the issue of gender, no less. Uh, so um, looking forward to that. Thank you all very much. Uh, this uh, we hope you're all okay with the fact that this um, presentation has been recorded, um, and and that recording, once it's had a little bit of editing, will go up on our YouTube channel for you guys to to watch. Um, if you if you would like um, in the future. So with that, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon or, or evening or morning, depending on where you are. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you, Becky, for moderating. Bye. Cheers. Bye, Anne.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gessie. Thank you. Bye-bye.